So hello, our name is our name is Plantasaurus, and our, the name of our project is called Buffer Zones: Protecting Our Waterways with Native Plants. And so my name is Kirsten Trayer. I'm Lydia Hallback. I'm Rachel Danielson. And I'm Zachary Strumpert. And we are here today to present our project. In this presentation, we will cover defining the problem our questions and hypothesis, our study and research on buffer zones, testing for phosphorus, cost of our solution, and talking to the community. Okay, so the problem that we found in our area is runoff from land, such as farms or residential areas, is getting into the waterways and is called, causing algae booms, um, is causing excessive weed growth, the death of fish, and is opening the gateway to invasive species. Speaking of algae blooms, we've had multiple problems with algae in the past, and I'm not sure if anyone's heard about this, but about a week ago in Alexandria, a dog was actually killed after ingesting blue-green algae. Blue-green algae is actually the algae that is found most often in our area because of excess amounts of phosphorus, nitrates, and other nutrients that can cause harm and create algae blooms. The dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico is about the size of New Jersey, about six to 7,000 square miles. This is caused by an excessive amount of phosphorus and nitrogen from the water flowing down to the Gulf of Mexico over a produced, the overproduced nutrient kills plants and animals in the water. And this is caused by the Mississippi River, which as we know, starts in Minnesota. And so our goal with this project is to fix what starts with us so that the Gulf doesn't have as many problems. So you guys might be wondering what a buffer is. A buffer is a protected area along a waterway that can help keep um, fertilizer, phosphates, and sediments out of the water. So for this project, we had to come up with a question and a hypothesis. And so our question is, what are the benefits of native plants versus planting turf grasses in a buffer? Our hypothesis was that we thought native plants would absorb more phosphorus than turf grasses when planted in a buffer. And this is a picture of us working with our plants in the greenhouse. So there are several benefits that buffer zones can have. One benefit is buffer zones absorb 50% or more of pesticides that would have run into the water. Also, buffer zones stop 75% or more of sediments from running into waterways. Also, the roots of the plants in buffers hold in the soil, so it slows down erosion. It provides animals with habitats along high waterways. It shades the water for some species that like the shade, and it protects the water quality. It'll also add privacy, so the taller, lusher plants are going to prevent people on the lakes, like on a boat or something, from seeing as much of your yard. It'll reduce lawn maintenance. You don't have to take care of as much. You aren't going to have to mow it. You don't have to water as much either. It also discourages Canadian geese from landing on that strip. As we can see, it adds natural beauty because we have some wonderful black-eyed Susans here and some other wonderful plants and in our native pollinator bin as well. So it adds natural beauty, so when you're looking out, you're not just seeing random plants sprouting. Sometimes you'll see flowers as well. It adapts to the local climate because we chose plants that are native to Minnesota, except for the sodgrass, and so it adapts to your local ecosystem. And the final thing is it needs less water because if it is planted next to a waterway, it'll get watered naturally through that, and the native plants also absorb more water. poster of, um, it shows some roots, it's a little blurry, but here is the sod grass. So that is the length of the plant and the roots. This is the length of native plants. So d in this one, the roots come all the way down to here, and you can see they're much bushier. This is a buffer over here around a stream through a farm field. This is a stream without a buffer. In this diagram, 
of a buffer, we can see diverse structure of vegetative filter strip offers diverse ecosystem services. So what that means is that the different native plants in a buffer will provide habitats for animals in our area, like birds and bees and deer and animals like that. The dense root growth enables retention and uptake in plant nutrients, such as nitrogen and phosphorus, and other pollutants from dispersed pollution sources. So what this means is that the roots actually suck up the phosphorus and the nitrogen and store it. Over here, vegetation structured in several strips retain sediments from surface runoff and represent, and represent wind and dust barrier. So having the taller plants will help catch that sediment and um, slow down the wind to, again, keep that sediment there. So how we designed our project. The first thing is a picture of our bin when we were putting it together back in January. The second one is when we were testing our plants for phosphorus and taking care of our plants. And the first one is when we were putting in the dirt, the seeds, and the other things into our bins. So December. So when we started back in December, we defined the problem and brainstormed for our project. So we found out what we wanted to do, how we wanted to go about it, and things like that. And in January is when we came up or made our bins and planted our plants like these. So we made sure that the soil would be elevated so the water that we put onto it would go down so that the water would be able to come out to be tested. And we used this tube to drain the water out. In February, we noticed that the turf grasses that we planted, which is this bin right here, it was growing um, first. There were no other sprouts. And it grew so quickly that we had to cut it within the same month that it sprouted. In the mixed bin, the native grasses and pollinators started growing taller than most other bins in March. And then in April is when we saw that the native pollinators were starting to grow, so buds were starting to form, and the flowers were starting to bloom. All right, in May, we noticed that the pollinators were the tallest and that all the plants were getting much thicker. We fertilized the bins with manure and phosph phosphate pellets, and we began our testing. These are the kind of phosphate pellets we used. You can find them at Menards or at the Home Depot pretty much anywhere you buy garden supplies. And in the state of Minnesota, you cannot find phosphorus in lawn fertilizer, so that is one of the kinds that you will not be able to find phosphorus in. In June, we finished testing and started analyzing the results. And so now we'll talk about our bins. But first, I would like to mention that we are very pleased that the Central Lakes College in Brainerd partnered with us and let us use their greenhouse to take care of these plants. These plants have actually been growing since January, so they're actually at the end of their cycle, and that's why it looks like we have a few dead plants. And so when we drew sticks to see which plant we would get, I ended up with the native grasses, which is this bend. And so while I've been taking care of them, I've noticed that I don't have to water them as much or as often because the roots, as we had stated earlier, soak up a lot of water. We also have a journal with us, if you guys would like to look at it soon, of every day we went in and watered. Each person had a different day, and we documented what we saw, how moist the soil was, if we have any growth, if we have any bugs in the plants, and what's going on. I had the mixed bin, so it was a mixture of the native grasses and the pollinators, and I found that it had the best of both worlds. So with the native grasses, it helped retain the water a little bit better, and it also helped retain soak up more phosphorus. And then with the pollinators, it would attract like pollinating animals such as bees and birds. And it, like, and it also has a longer root system, so it will help hold in the soil a little bit better. I had the sod or turf bin. It is Kentucky bluegrass. Like I said earlier, it was the first to sprout. It was the fastest growing. We had to cut it several times throughout the project. Um, it had very short roots, so a lot of water ran through it. Um, so we, we got a lot, many cups, about eight cups a test of water running off. I had the pollinators. The pollinators have the longest roots, so they probably sucked up a lot more phosphorus and water, so you had to water them less. Um, the pollinators attracted bees, and they had aphids, so we had to spray it with an aphid-killing chemical. 
And so this is a picture of a poster that we found that states some of the plants that we have in here. Zach, would you like to talk about the plants? This one is the fragrant hyssop, which we actually have growing right here. This one is the butterfly milkweed, which we do not have with us because we didn't get any in our seed pack mix. This is the prairie clover, um, stiff goldenrod, spotted bee balm, golden alexanders, which we had in the pollinator bun, but they've already gone through their cycle, black-eyed Susans, hair bells. We did not have any of those in our seed mix. Prairie smoke, wild petunia, American pas pascal flower, and the yellow coneflower. These are various plants that we have in the pollinators in this bin. We do not have all these plants in the bins, but these are just what pictures of pollinators that we would recommend to plant and stuff, to attract bees and stuff. And these are also like things that are plants that are like we, that you would be able to see in various places. What is phosphorus? Phosphorus is an essential element classified as a micronutrient. Because of its relatively large amount of phosphorus is required by plants. Phosphorus is one of the three main nutrients in, phos in fertilizers. One of the main roles of phosphorus is to transfer energy in a living organism. So how we tested is that in the beginning of May, we started with putting fertilizer on it. We put two different types. We put the phosphate pellets, and then we also put livestock manure. And we waited a week so that the fertilizer would settle. So we ran about. On each of them, we have a rule that if eight, if eight cups goes on one, every single one of them is going to get eight cups, so we have a more accurate measurement. And then as soon as we see water coming out, we take that water and we put a test strip in it. And so we put it in there for a second, and as soon as we see results coming out of it, we will write that result down, and we also will write down the amount of runoff that comes off so we know how much water is coming that it, the plant is retaining. Parts per million. And it's also measured in parts per million, if you guys want. So the, so the testing for phosphorus, we have some results here. Zach will t grab those graphs over there and pass them around so you guys can see them. But when we were testing our plants, we found that certain plants sucked up more phosphorus than others, and certain plants were also very inaccurate. Like one bin had this much sucked up, while the other had way less amounts. So I'll let Lydia talk about which one we thought was the best. So, because of our results that we found from our study, we found that the mixed bin was actually the one that we suggest planting because the results for the phosphorus levels from the um, fertilizer, by the manure and the phosphorus, they were both low and they were consistent with each. So the 49 for the phosphorus and the 50 for the manure, those are very close. Also, for as Rachel said earlier, you get kind of the best of both worlds because you have the pollinators, which attracts the butterflies and the bees, and you have the grass that offers the ground cover for more sediment catching and um, absorption. And so the cost of plants. So if Zach would like to grab that bag right there and bring it up to you guys, we'll talk about it. So that is one of the mixes we've used and what we would recommend when we partnered with the Crowing County Soil and Water Conservation District. And so working with our mentor, he helped us find this bag of seeds and it cost $35 to plant in a 100 square foot buffer with the thing, with the bag of seeds. And so the pollinator and native grass mix are both in there as well. And so that can be planted along an agricultural strip, it can be planted on a lake, it depends upon where you need it and where it would work best for you. And so there's also other kinds available, 
like the butterfly mix, which is a mix of pollinators. And that costs $132 per pound, and that covers about an acre. So for the people who are working with agriculture, that would be a bigger amount for them. And then we have the lakeshore mix, which includes native grasses and the pollinators, which costs $186.20 per pound per acre. And so the Crow Wing County Soil and Water Conservation District will partner with people in the area who cannot afford it. And if they can't afford it, they will pay half of the amount of the seed mix so that they will be able to afford it and that we can get buffers out easier for people. And so we would recommend partnering with them. We have also heard that many other places around the state do this as well. So as you can see this from this poster, I'll read it off. Behold our living soil. Healthy soil is teeming with life, and that life provides nearly everything we need to survive. That's why USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Services is working with America's farmers and ranchers to help, to help keep it fun healthy and functioning for life. As, as you can see, soil is a key thing in our life. And without these buffers to help keep the soil in place, that soil can go into lakes and cause many, many problems. Together, Together we, we can, can help, help make, make our waterways, waterways healthy again. again. And so we went out and we talked to the community in many different ways. Let's hear about it. So the first place we went to was a garden expo at Central Lakes College in Brainerd. So we set up a table and a board and we had a couple bins and we got questions from fellow gardeners and naturalists from the area. Um, they were a lot of situational questions. Like I remember one man asked me what he would suggest planting in a drainage ditch by his house and we recommended uh, native plants like these to suck up the water. And then we went to the Baxter Sandpapers 4 H Club to present to the members and to help us have a little bit, another chance to present and get a little bit more feedback. We also went to the Dagger Brook 4 H Club and showed them our plants, showed them how we did everything. And Zach, what did we do last? Um, last we went to our local 4 H livestock PDC and we spoke to them and they had a couple of interesting questions. And that was our last hurrah before we came to see you guys. So, and we want to thank Darren Myers, Myers for helping us. He works with the Crowing County Soil and Water District, and we knew that we wanted to work with water or water and plants. And when he talked to us about buffer zones, it really sparked our interest, and that made us want to research it more. So, without him, we would not have made. We probably would have come up with it, or might have. But without him, he really, really helped us do research and give us feedback and stuff like that. So I will go over the bibliography quick. So our put down some rich, pi rich picture came from the ncalamo.com, which is a bookstore. The rock buffer picture came from nativelandscapes.com. The flower buffer picture came from ourneighborhoods.org. The LG waves came from site.org. And the agriculture picture came from delawarelivablelawns.org. Buffer explanation came from limnos dot sci. Natural buffer came from blog.midwestlakes.org. The Mississippi dead zone picture came from water.usgs.gov. The buffer info came from the Crowing County swcd.org. And the Kentucky bluegrass seed picture came from the University of Minnesota.edu. Thank you for having us Thank today. You. Any questions? <laughs> um, do you wish that you would have had one tote or tub of what if I did nothing hmm. and question. what your results would have been and what I guess maybe what your expectations might be if you had a nothing what if I did nothing tote I had thought about that and we all did but we decided that rather than test the effect the effectivity, I guess, of a buff buffer itself, we're rather testing the different kinds of plants relative to each other. So we were, rather than comparing grass to nothing, we were comparing more grass to pollinators. So 
I guess it was just a little different kind of study. Mm -hmm. We could probably add that for next time as well. Yeah, uh, so I have two questions, and I and I, I think they, you may think they might be related. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, native grasses and the pollinators generally have a lot deeper uh, uh, root depth, and and you showed us that mm -hmm. than than the turf grass. Um, my questions are um, with the turf grass. Um, why do you suppose that the uh, that the, the phosphorus levels were lower than anything else? Uh, and number two, do you suppose that might have something to do, or how do you feel about if you had tested these with a depth that was considerably deeper than what you have now? Okay. It's gonna talk about this. Okay. You want an answer? So, I. If I understand your question correctly, are you looking at the manure results for the phosphorus runoff and how the sod was lower? Not, not, only, not only that, but the, uh, the level of your, uh, of your cones in particular, yeah. uh, given that we naturally would have a lot deeper root depth mm -hmm. than zero and a half. Yes. Um, I was consulting with, well, we all were consulting with our mentor, Darren Myers, and we were trying to figure out why that happened because it wasn't what we expected. It wasn't part of our hypothesis. So he, we had talked about it, and we figured that it's because it's from the manure, that because the sod was so dense compared to the other plants, that maybe the manure did not reach the soil all the way, mm -hmm. and it was held up, so not all of it went into the soil. Plus, for our next thing, we are planning on planting, planting them in deeper bins so we can have the let the roots have their full potential so we can actually see them. We didn't really think about this in the beginning, so it's kind of a design flaw that we would fix if we were to do it over again. So one of the roles, as I understand, with buffer strips is that it intercepts water that comes from the uh, field that, that drains to it. Mm -hmm. so, so the way you have your setup now, you're measuring the water that's coming from below the surface but if the buffer is designed to sort of filter surface runoff, mm -hmm. how might you change your experimental design in the future to really evaluate the ability of these buffers to capture things that run over it, I guess, as opposed to things that run throughout the bottom of it? We would probably make it a little bit larger scale than this so that maybe we could tilt the ramp a little bit so that when we watered, if it didn't soak up right away, then it would run over. And then we could possibly test that as well to see what came off the surface right away. Another thing we could do is kind of take part of that and tip it. And then we could take, say, a cup of loose sediment or dirt, pour it on the back if this side was raised, and then pour water, and then have a ledge on the other side and me measure how much sediment falls out on the other side. In your presentation, you talked about um, uh, protecting our soils, mm -hmm. um, and, and you kind of focused on that a little bit in your presentation. Um, but in your research, I didn't see where you were testing any turbidity in the water. Uh, what what type? What soil actually came through those tubes? Mm -hmm. um, is there a reason for that um, due to the nature of your presentation or is that something that maybe in the future that you'll research? Um, when we had when we were testing the runoff that came off we didn't have any soil really coming out of the tubes it was mainly just water um, the soil was pretty packed in there and we didn't on the bottom we couldn't see any soil and I don't because of our long landscaping fabric as well it's kind of trapped in there so we would probably have to have a thinner material next time to have more of that as a test. 